Hello and welcome to Lecture 11. I'm Chris Mack, the professor for your class from Data to Decisions. In this lecture, we'll talk about how to generate and use normal probability plots and their more generic equivalent, QQ plots. Normal probability plots will be for the assumption of a normal distribution and more general QQ plots will be for any distribution you may want to assume. And as we talked about in the last lecture, we sometimes have to evaluate whether a set of residuals follows a, something like or close to a normal distribution or not. Uh, we need to make this evaluation check the assumptions of an ordinary least squares regression. But there are other uses for normal probability plots or QQ plots anytime we want to guess or estimate the probability distribution for a set of data. Uh, bef before I show you exactly how to generate a normal probability plot or a QQ plot in general, uh, here's an example of one. What we are going to plot is the actual results from my experiment. Here I have an experiment and all of the values that came out of that experiment were from uh, 374 up to 435. Those are the numbers that came out. And then I'm going to uh, calculate an expected result in that experiment, assuming a certain probability distribution. If we assume a normal probability distribution, so the, the results of this experiment have a mean and a standard deviation that is normally distributed about that mean, then uh, I can calculate the expected results. I, I plot expected versus actual and I should get a straight line, y equals x. If I do, then I get, uh, uh, excuse me, I get something like uh, a normal probability distribution as the reasonable model for that probability distribution. If I get something significantly different from a straight line, then I need to evaluate why that is so. All right, I'll come back to interpreting this plot in a moment. Let's start with how we generate it. The steps for generating a norm, normal probability plot will sound at first to be just a set of, you know, well, do this, then this, then this calculation steps. But uh, if you think about it and, and practice it a few times, uh, you'll begin to understand where it's coming from. So we begin with a set of data. Uh, we'll use this mostly for residuals. So we'll have a rank order of all the residuals from the smallest to the largest. Uh, we'll call k equal 1, the first one, all the way counting up to k equal n for a sample size of n. Then we'll calculate what's called the rank quantile. It's essentially the empirical cumulative distribution function. And it's something like k over n. Uh, we're going to find that there's some variations of this that are a little bit better than exactly k over n, but, but you can see what we're going for here. So when k is 1, that, then our smallest value has a cumulative distribution of a very small number. And when k equals n, the largest value in our data set, uh, then we have the we've accumulated all the way up to about 1 for our cumulative distribution function. Given this empirical CDF, I will calculate an expected data point value given an assumed probability distribution function. How do I do that? I take the inverse of this, this empirical CDF value. I take the inverse CDF of whatever UK I calculated. Remember, K is the rank ordered number of that data point, and N is the um, total number of data points I have. So I, I just plug in K over N, or I'll show you some variations of that in just a moment. And then I take the inverse CDF. Well, if I'm assuming a normal distribution for my data, then I'm going to take an inverse normal. CDF. Uh, many programs like Excel have a built-in inverse standard normal CDF function. So I supply it the, the UK value. I, I, I perform this function, inverse standard normal. 
I multiply by the standard deviation of all the x values, and then I add the mean of all the x values. Right, so inverse standard normal has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, so I need to expand it by multiplying by the standard deviation of the data set, shift it by adding the mean of the data set, and that becomes my expected data point. I've got an actual data point. Now I have a calculated or expected data point. Assuming a normal distribution is an accurate a description of the PDF, of these data points. Now plot actual data versus expected data. Now I'm, I, here I say uh, the empirical CDF is k over n, or some variation of it. Well, here are some of the variations that people use. What you want to avoid is uh, um, uk equal to 1, because if, if I just had k over n, like I showed before, then at k equals n, then uk must be equal to 1, and uh, only an infinite, infinitely large data point will have a uk exactly equal to 1 that, that integrates to all possible values. So we want to avoid that. And we do that typically by adding 1 to n. So, um, and we could do that, but but then there are other ways of of doing that where I subtract off a, a small value a uh, from the numerator and denominator of this function. Uh, and there's reasons for wanting to do it one way or another, but here are a set of very very uh, uh, published values of of the a term that is used. We're going to use this one. This is, I think, the most commonly used in the statistics world. Um, the exact reasons why we use this 0.3175 and 0.365 are not really that important for us. But uh, And as long as n is, is kind of large, the choice doesn't really matter that much. Um, I'll show you in the next lecture, I'm actually going to show you in Excel how to generate a normal probability plot. And then I'll give you just a couple more details on this calculation. But quite frankly, as long as n is, is reasonably large, you know, the, the nuances of, of any of these things is, is quite, quite small. It doesn't matter that much which one we pick. But we're going to use this one. Uh, number five here is also a popular one. And my numbering, by the way, from one to nine is actually uh, based on these references. So these are, in fact, um, specific papers that have described why they should use one or the other of these uh, methods. But as I said, we're going to use this uh, number two as our most popular one. All right. What will happen if the Here's a, here's a plot of residuals from an ordinary least squares fit. If the residuals are normally distributed and we calculate an expected result, the way I just mentioned, assuming a normal distribution, that is we use the inverse normal distribution to calculate the expected result, then we should expect to see a straight line y equals x. That is, you expect the actual result to equal the expected result. If everything is working exactly like, of course, it never will be exactly because of statistical variations. But if those statistical variations are normally distributed, then on average, this will look kind of like a straight line. And well, that's what we see here. Uh, this kind of, you know, a little bit of deviations uh, all through the fit are much to be expected. You see most of the data points are congregated near the middle, so you have kind of a high density of points in this region. The, de the points get sparser the further away from zero you get, because remember, I'm plotting here residuals, so residuals have a mean of zero. This will be my mean value, and then uh, most of the values are congregated around the mean, and then they get fewer and fewer out to either side. But if we get something that sort of looks like a straight line, we start feeling, oh yeah, this, this might be uh, close to a normal distribution. If I have a distribution that is symmetric but has heavy tails, then I see kind of an S-shaped curve where, where it comes down, looks sort of straight for a while, and then, and then comes down again. 
In other words, if my expected result is here, say 420, my actual result is larger, say 430. If my expected result is, say, 390, my actual result is smaller in this line. Uh, and, and that means the actual results are more extreme than my expected results. When the actual results are more extreme than the expected results, then we know we have heavy tails in our distribution. On the other hand, if we have light tails, then the expected result is larger than the actual result. And so we see this S shape to the curve if we have light tails compared to a normal distribution. We can also detect skew. Uh, if you're skewed, then you have kind of heavy tails on one side and light tails on the other. So here's a skewed right. We have heavy tails on the right, light tails on the left. And if I'm skewed left, I have light tails on the right, and the heavy tail exists over here on the left. So I, I'm below the expected value uh, on the on the left and above um, below the expected value on the right, uh, but it but it has kind of a curve shaped like this as opposed to the skewed right, which has a curve shaped like this, uh, where you can see they're both above. All right, so we can see basic ideas like it's skewed uh, here. But can we do something a little bit more than just eyeballing these results? And the answer is yes. Because we're plotting something that we think should be the line y equals x, we would expect to see a correlation coefficient close to 1. So we can simply calculate the correlation coefficient of the actual versus expected and compare to this table. This table was generated by doing some simulations and they, they, they varied uh, statistically, just randomly created normal distributions and said, well, most of the time you get correlation coefficients of this and above. And from that, we can uh, estimate whether or not it's likely that you get this deviation from the correlation coefficient of 1 given just normal random variations. So you supply a certain significance level, for example, 0.05 for a 95% confidence um, kind of uh, assessment, alpha of 0.05. Then for a given size of the data point, let's say you had 70 data points, and you would expect to see a correlation coefficient of 0.983 or above if values truly were normal. If you see a correlation coefficient below that, that number of data points and this significance level that you're interested in, then you uh, there's not evidence in this normal probability plot for a normal distribution. So we say if the correlation coefficient is above this critical value, and these, this, these tabled values show the critical values, and we can't reject hypothesis that the true distribution is normal, but if you see a value less than these critical values, then you reject that null hypothesis, and you say that the data does not support a hypothesis that the distribution is normal. So that's how we use this uh, critical correlation coefficient approach for a normal probability plot. You can also use this kind of plot in a more generalized way. So instead of assuming a normal distribution, if we assume some other kind of distribution, then we call this a generalized QQ plot. Normal distribution, normal probability plot is a special case of the more general QQ plot. Uh, we use the inverse normal CDF for a normal probability plot, but we can use any CDF that's invertible to calculate our expected result. And therefore, we can test uh, probability dis distribution other than normal, uh, given our data. We plot the actual result versus the expected result. Uh, if we have parameter values, we adjust those parameter values to see if we can get the, the straightest line and um, find out if 
a different distribution produces something closer to a straight line uh, instead of a normal distribution. Uh, what kind of distributions you can should you use? Test well it depends on uh, the support that is the range of of the x values that your data exhibits. So if your range only goes from lower limit to an upper limit, use you might use a beta distribution. Beta distribution that has support from zero to one, but of course you can scale it and shift it so that it goes from any starting value to any ending value. And you have these two parameters, alpha and beta. You can adjust to make it symmetric, skewed left, skewed right, over that range. The gamma distribution is a good uh, uh, general distribution. It has two parameters, either parameterized as k and uh, theta or alpha and beta. It goes from zero to infinity. So it goes to infinity on one side, but it has a lower limit. And uh, again, you can make this distribution more or less symmetric uh, and um, more or less skewed, depending on the value of the parameters. Uh, other distributions that have the same support are things like the log normal, the F distribution, Weibull, Rayleigh, Maxwell, Boltzmann, and, and quite frankly, lots of other ones as well. And you'll see in some cases that, that some distributions are preferred over others. Sometimes we see that our distribution is symmetric, but it has either heavier or lighter tails than our normal distribution. So if we have a symmetric distribution with support from minus infinity to infinity, we might look at the Cauchy, double exponential, the student's t distribution, the logistic distribution, and of course, our old favorite, the normal distribution. So let's look at what we've learned in lecture 11. You should be able to quickly and easily answer each of these questions. If not, please go back and review the material. What are the steps for generating a normal probability plot? How does one interpret the shape of a normal probability plot? If you see a particular shape, what does it tell you about the true distribution compared to your assumed normal distribution? And finally, how can we test for normality using a normal probability plot? Well, that's our lecture 11. In the next lecture, I'll actually demonstrate using Excel how we actually uh, perform these calculations and generate one of these plots. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Forgot one last question at the end. I thought we were done. But uh, what other distributions can we test against a given data set? in a QQ plot if we don't want to test just for a normal probability plot. All right, that's our lecture. Till next time.